anything alive on this planet has some value and value to humans some more than others and the value of bats is to humans is really tremendous so all of our bats in tennessee are insectivorous they eat tremendous amounts of bugs and insects every night these bats are they have a maternity colony in these caves so they're raising their young inside the cave and nursing their young and they have to produce a lot of energy for that so they're out eating almost their entire weight every night in insects beetles, moths, flies, things that we generally consider pests, either to agriculture or forestry or mosquitoes, you know, things like that. Um, and without them, we would be applying a lot more herbicide in the environment, using a lot more bug spray in general. They're sort of called the farmer's best friend. There was a study a few years ago tried to come up with how much, you know, dollar-wise uh, bats are of value to Tennesseans, and they figured about $313 million just to agriculture alone. This project is we're trying to understand how these bats use the landscape so we can protect those areas better. We don't know a lot about them. There's a lot of just general information that we don't know about bats that people would think we should and would, uh, but they're really challenging to study. They don't like to be bothered by people. They generally don't like to be around people. They're small, they fly at night. So it's really hard to get just basic information on them. This will be the first time we've done it on gray bats. Uh, gray bats are an endangered species. They've been listed since 1976. They've been a really good success story. Uh, when they were listed, there were thought to be around a million bats in the world. Now we're up over five million bats. They occur only in the cave regions of the Southeast and the Ozarks. And now we're trying to understand uh, sort of how these bats use the landscape more. And we started developing a model to predict where they might occur on the landscape and where they might fly and forage about two years ago. And this is gonna help us really ground truth that model and dial it in a lot better. So here's the transmitter we'll be gluing onto the bats. It's a um, VHF transmitter. It basically just emits a really high frequency radio signal that we'll pick up with our receivers. And it just sounds like beep beep and it weighs uh, 0.32 grams and we expect the bats to weigh about 12 grams 12 to 15 grams so the transmitter will be about four percent of the bats mass and the glue that we attach this with to the bat is a uh, surgical cement and the the glue itself will last about three to four weeks and then the transmitter will fall off this is a telemetry receiver, so this emits the high frequency radio signal and this picks it up. And that's the signal that it's emitting. Just like on your radio in your car, you just have to tune in the frequency of the signal and I just tuned it in. So it's activated now. We've never uh, tracked bats during a foraging time of year like we are tonight. We typically do migration studies and they're a little bit easier. We can go in the caves, pick the bats up, and then uh, follow them on a migratory route. Tonight's a little bit different. We're gonna be using small nets and traps uh, set out on the landscape to catch the bats as they're coming out. Um, and we're, we're trying to find uh, adult females whose young are already out and flying. Females that are ready, ready to leave their, their juveniles and, and move on and do their own thing. And we'll just be measure them, weigh them, give them a little haircut on the back, and glue a transmitter that lasts about 21 days. She's a post-lactating uh, endangered female gray bat. And the first thing I'm going to do is find the center of her uh, shoulder blades here. And then I'm going to give her a haircut and trim a little bit of fur off so we can attach the transmitter right to her skin. It's a pretty stressful um, situation, yeah, but you know. Um, we'll hold these bats for typically less than 30 minutes, and they're, they're okay after that, you know. So now I'm just going to apply a little bit of pressure, and you're going to hold it there for about five minutes, and let the glue start to dry. Steve Samray is a consultant for Copperhead Consulting. They're an uh, environmental consulting agency. And Steve's a Tennessean, he's been around a long time, around bats and conservation. He's volunteered and worked for the Nature Conservancy. He helped build these gates on these caves, you know, over a decade ago. And he'll be piloting the airplane tonight and uh, helping us track these bats. He'll be in the plane with a receiver and we'll have receivers. And he really had, does the heavy lifting of, of following these bats and flying along with them and, and radioing down, letting us know where they're at and what they're doing.
So the work in the plane is, is really challenging. It's a small two-seater plane and you're generally flying in circles. Planes can only fly so slow and these bats, they're fast for bats, but they're still pretty slow. So the plane will be up there flying little bitty circles, following these bats along and taking coordinates very regularly and keeping a, a track log of where these bats are and where they're moving, radioing information down to us. And then of course they have to stop for fuel several times throughout the night. Uh, the plane and the ground crews will be out from, from dusk until dawn when these bats are active and foraging, trying to keep up with them. Uh, and when the plane goes for fuel, we have to try and keep up with it with the bats with vehicles. And it, it can get pretty challenging. And so we know this is a gray bat because it has a really big foot, really big foot. And also the fur on this is uh, one color. So on a lot of bats, you'll see two to three different colors of fur, but this fur, the whole strand is about the same color. And so that's a characteristic of gray bats. And also it's hard to tell, but gray bats are the only um, myotis, which is the genus, that have a notch in the claw. So you can see a little notch in the claw there. And that's another um, distinctive characteristic of gray bats. So I've already weighed him. And next we want to get the forearm length, which is another metric that we always measure. Uh, next we'll look at wing damage. So over the winter, white nose syndrome, the, um, the vegetative part of the fungi actually grows down into their skin cells and it can cause uh, damage to the wing membrane or, or actually any unfurred portion of the bat. And you can see that uh, in the spring and early summer. It heals after that, but on this particular bat I don't see any damage. There are a few little mites on there, uh, which is normal for gray bats. So next we're going to put a band on this bat. And we just want to make sure that it can't come off, but it can still slide up and down the forearm. Oh, oh I got bit. And um, now that's all the data we need. So you're ready to go, Ben. So the primary thing we're trying to learn with this study is trying to really dial in the habitat that these bats are using, where they're foraging, and uh, what we can expect their sort of critical habitats to be. And we're gonna use that information to help Tennessee grow in a responsible way. I mean, Putnam County, Jackson County, all of Tennessee is progressing and growing all the time. New developments coming in, new things like wind energy, things that could potentially be threats for bats. And uh, with the information we'll gain here, we can just help that growth occur in a responsible manner. Doesn't impact the bats, doesn't impact the bats' ability to be out here eating insects that we really want them to be doing.